Greetings everyone. In this video we'll explore how to determine the overall QRS axis on the 12 lead EKG. In order to do that, one method of doing that is called the quadrant method where we'll establish a four quadrant system by using two specific leads. Those will be leads 1 and leads AVF. And the reason we've chosen those two leads is because lead 1 is the only perfectly horizontal lead and that's because it's created between the right arm and the left arm where the right arm is negative, the left arm is positive, and normally it's created just between these two. So that's a perfectly horizontal lead of lead one. Next we'll look at AVF. AVF's a little bit more complicated. Remember AVF is created by Eindhoven's triangle where we take the right arm and we combine it with the left arm to create a new lead which is right in the middle of those two, finds the midpoint. And then the other pole of that is the left leg. And this creates a new lead which is perfectly vertical and that is lead AVF. And of course all of the augmented voltage leads are positive in nature and the other end is Wilson Central Terminal and that has a zero value. All right, so when you take lead one and you take lead AVF, you essentially create a quadrant system where you can now label these quadrants. And you can also define these quadrants by giving them some degrees or some numbers. So this is zero degrees, this is 90 degrees, this of course 180 degrees, and this one is negative 90 degrees. So the two leads we're going to use, leads 1 and AVF, we're going to use those exclusively. There are certainly other methods out there, but these are the easiest ways of, uh, of determining the overall axis. All right, so when we're talking about axis deviation, specifically in this video, we're talking about the frontal axis. This will be in the frontal plane. And we're essentially looking to see if we depolarize ventricular tissue, in which direction is that ventricular tissue depolarizing in? And we can accomplish that by looking and assigning a specific angle to that. This is a vector in essence, so there's a direction and a length of that vector. And we'll be able to determine that by looking at leads one and AVF. And again, you'll notice that this is lead one here, perfectly horizontal, and this is lead AVF. And then we'll have our little quadrants in these different areas here. So let's take a look at a little bit more. This is just a graphic representation of how the overall QRS complex will appear on the 12 lead EKG depending on which direction it's traveling in. So if you take this as Wilson Central Terminal, take this as the AV node, the absolute center of the heart, if the ventricles depolarize in, uh, from the view of lead AVF, so remember lead AVF is our perfectly vertical lead where it's positive down at the left leg, if we have depolarization of ventricular tissue in this direction, like so, you'll see that the QRS is not only upright, but it's going to be the tallest of all of the other QRSs. And the reason for that is because the depolarization vector is heading directly in the direction of that positive lead of AVF. So if the depolarization happens in this fashion or in this fashion, we'll also get a positive QRS because, in fact, all of this is positive territory. No matter where you're heading here, this is all positive territory because it's to the bottom of this separator, which is the, the big red line here, separates positive and negative. So negative is up here and positive is down below. So anytime depolarization heads in the direction of positive, you're going to get a positive deflection on the EKG. Now, what will change is the amplitude or the vertical displacement of that QRS complex. In other words, as we start moving away from lead AVF, but still in a positive manner, the amplitude of that QRS complex tends to become smaller than it does if you're heading immediately in the direction of that lead. All right, so now conversely, if we have depolarization moving away from lead AVF, moving away from the positive lead, we get a negative deflection and the same rules hold true. If you are moving exactly opposite of the direction of AVF, you'll get the deepest QRS deflection. And it will be negatively oriented, of course, because you're heading away from positive. And then no matter where you end up up here, it doesn't matter where your direction is. As long as you're traveling away from or upwards from this red line, you're in the territory of negative, and you'll get a negative QRS. It will, the only thing that will change then is the overall depth of that QRS complex. 
So now let's take a look at lead one. So this is the perfectly horizontal lead. You'll see it's negative over here. It's positive at the left arm. And so if we separate this right down the middle, which is what that red line's doing, now we can start taking a look at, again, this is our central reference point here. This is Wilson Central Terminal or the AV node. And when the QRS or when the ventricles depolarize immediately in the direction of the left arm, you're going to get a nice upright QRS complex. And the reason for that is it's heading towards positive, in fact, immediately in the direction of that left arm electrode. And you're going to get a nice tall QRS complex. Again, this is the territory of positive, And therefore, any time there's depolarization of the ventricles in the direction to the right of the screen here, you're going to get a positive deflection on your, QR, on your EKG. And that QRS complex, therefore, will be upright. Now, If the opposite happens and we get depolarization in the direction of the right arm, meaning away from the positive pole of the left arm, then we're going to get our tallest, or I should say our deepest, QRS deflection. <clears throat> um, and all of those other rules still apply. So this is all territory of the negative lead of the right arm. And as a result, no matter which direction we travel in here, in these quadrants area or anything towards the left as you're looking at the screen, patient's right, you're going to get a negatively deflected QRS complex. All right, so let's take a look at these uh, in summation. So if we have a positive lead one, that means that the depolarization must be traveling in the direction of the right arm. If we have a positive lead AVF, that must mean that we have a deflection that's traveling towards the feet. And as a result, if we were to draw this quadrant, In order for us to have a depolarization that's traveling in this direction and a depolarization that's happening in this direction, the only spot where these two things overlap is in this quadrant here, and this is the quadrant between 0 and 90 degrees, and this is known as the normal axis. Now, I'm kind of shortchanging you because, in fact, normal axis kind of goes from about negative 30 degrees to about 120 degrees, so it's a little bit broader than what we're displaying, but it's important to understand that this is an easy way, and this is a simple way of looking at the EKG very, very quickly and determining a rough ballpark. Are you normal, or is there a big problem? All right, so let's take a look at these next guys here. So we're going to do the same thing. We'll draw ourselves a little quadrant here. Let's take a look at the next one. So here's our intersection of leads 1 and AVF. And in this case, we have a positive lead one, which must mean that we're traveling in this direction somewhere. And here in this case, we have a negative lead AVF, which must mean that we're traveling in this direction also. Where they overlap is in this quadrant here. And this change is called left axis deviation. And this is somewhere between zero and negative 90 degrees. This is called left axis deviation. All right, let's take a look at the two remaining guys here will reestablish our grid. There's our grid here. And in this case, we have a negative lead one. In order for us to have a negative lead one, we must be traveling somewhere in this direction. And in addition to that, the other piece is that we have a positive AVF, which means we must be traveling in this direction. Our overlap is in this quadrant. And this quadrant signifies 90 degrees to 180 degrees. This is known as right axis deviation. All right, and last but not least, the last quadrant we haven't touched yet. Let's take a quick peek. In order for us to have a negatively oriented lead one, we must be traveling in this direction. And in order for us to have a negative lead AVF, we must be traveling in this direction. And our overlap is in this quadrant. This quadrant is between 180 degrees and 270 degrees. And this is known as extreme right axis deviation, also referred to as no man's land. All right, so this is just a simple way. This you have to kind of commit to memory. And if you, are, if you forget this, then hopefully you'll be able to kind of backtrack using the quadrant system. Remember, lead one is positive over here. Lead AVF is positive over here. And this should allow you to determine then what quadrant the final vectors traveling in. All right, so let's take a look at a few examples here. So this is just kind of a half sheet of a 12 lead EKG. I've cut off the precordial leads, which often happen to the right here. V1 through V6 are not on this drawing. The only thing we've left here 
are the important leads for this exercise, and that is lead 1 and lead AVF. So if we want to determine what the axis is here, we're going to quickly take a look at the orientation of lead 1 and decide, is it upright or is it negatively oriented? So take a QRS complex, I think we'll all agree, it is upright in this case. We're going to do the same thing for lead AVF. There's your QRS complex. It is also upright. In order for both of these to be upright, the only place this can be traveling is between 0 and 90 degrees. This is normal axis. Now, here's a little bit of a cheat for you. If you look on any 12 lead EKG, one of the bottom indicators here is going to be the P wave, the QRS, and the T wave axes. So this also translates to P, QRS, and T. This number in the middle is the QRS axis, and in fact, the EKG device has calculated a very specific 68 degrees. It tells us about normal axis. We got close. We said somewhere between 0 and 90, and that gives us exactly the same information. All right, so the cheat here, the quick cheat, is that you can always do the 12 lead EKG and take a quick peek at the number that's here. The EKG machine does do a pretty good job of that. The computer interpretation isn't so reliable, but these are usually pretty reliable. We'll talk more about that in a different video. So let's take a look at another example here. Again, our money leads here, leads 1 and AVF. Take a look at lead 1. Look at the QRS complex. It's predominantly upright. Now we move to lead AVF. QRS complex is inverted. If you forget what to do here, you can always draw yourself a little grid. Remember that lead 1 is positive at the left arm. Lead AVF is positive at the left leg. And let's take a look here. In order for lead 1 to be upright, we've got to be moving in this direction. In order for AVF to be negative, we have to be moving in this direction. This is our quadrant that we're operating in. This is the left axis deviation quadrant. So in fact, when we have left axis deviation, we're indicating that the patient's electrical vector is occurring somewhere between 0 and negative 90 degrees. And lo and behold, if you look at this m middle number here, it is negative 33 degrees. We're right on track with our quadrant system. Pretty simple. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, we'll go to lead 1, which is here. We'll go to lead AVF down here, and let's take a quick peek. So lead 1 is negatively oriented. Lead AVF is positively oriented. In order for us to end up there, we have to have a negative lead 1 traveling in this direction. An upright AVF must be traveling in this direction. This is our quadrant. This is the quadrant for right axis deviation. All right, we're almost done. We're almost done. We got one more example. All right, so let's take a look at this guy. This is our lead one here. This is our lead AVF here. And if you take this ginormous wide QRS complex here and also ginormous wide QRS complex here, negatively oriented, negatively oriented. Remember, in order to be negatively oriented in lead 1 and AVF. We've got to be traveling in these directions. This is our overlap quadrant, and this quadrant is known as extreme right axis deviation. We also said extreme right axis deviation provided a number of somewhere between 180 and 270 degrees, and in fact, if we look here, lo and behold, we end up with 229. That's pretty darn good for a quick peek. All right, so this is our last example. Let's uh, take a look at a few more things here. This is the cheat I was mentioning earlier on every 12 lead EKG. Take a look at that P, Q, R, S, and T axis line, and that middle number for you is going to provide you with somewhat of a specific number for the overall QRS axis. I remember this is only for the ventricles that we're looking at with that middle number. All right, so let's take a look at what we do with this information. All right, well, if we have left axis deviation, Important for us to think about two very common things associated with left axis deviation. The first is left ventricular hypertrophy can cause left axis deviation, and I'll tell you why that is in just a second. And the other one is left bundle branch block. So the two most common causes of left axis deviation are left ventricular hypertrophy and left bundle branch block. All right, so Let's take another look here uh, at uh, what the other guys are. So this is right axis deviation. Most commonly, 
right axis deviation associated with right ventricular hypertrophy. You'll see there's some commonality here, right, as we start moving uh, same direction. So left ventricular hypertrophy means moves the vector towards the left. Right ventricular hypertrophy, more muscle mass on the right ventricle, shifts that vector over to the right axis. The other right axis deviation uh, change of importance here is sodium channel blocker toxicity. This is an important one not to miss, and we'll talk more about that in a separate video. And then last but not least, extreme right axis deviation. This is generally very rare, and you're going to see it almost exclusively in VTAC. So VTAC is going to produce extreme right axis deviation. And I want to spend just a second on that just to explain why that's the case. So this is my best attempt at a heart. All right, here are the atria and the ventricles. All right, here is uh, our normal uh, depolarization. Normally things depolarize in this direction. But when we have ventricular tachycardia, so this is our SA, AV, ventricles, and we normally depolarize in that order. When we have a ventricular rhythm or ventricular tachycardia, we have a focus of stimulation that's originating in the ventricular tissue. And when that ventricular tissue depolarizes, it depolarizes in this direction. When it depolarizes in this direction, think about those two leads that we were looking at just a few moments ago to determine axis. We were looking at lead one and we were looking at lead AVF. So now let's plot this arrow right here. And you'll see that, in fact, when the ventricles depolarize backwards, I should say upwards, superiorly, they're actually moving away from the positive electrode in lead one and away from the positive electrode in AVF. And as a result, you end up in this quadrant, which is extreme right axis deviation. This is where you get a negative QRS in both leads one and AVF. So that's why VTAC produces this extreme right axis deviation. All right, so I want to add one more thing here, and that is a little bit of a pearl uh, take-home message. So the overall QRS axis always moves away from infarction, and it always moves in the direction of hypertrophy. So this is a little something that hopefully simplifies all of the things we have to remember here. So if you think about this, if tissue dies, if it infarcts, it makes sense that the QRS axis will move away from this because comparatively speaking now, the other side, the non-infarcted side, has more muscle mass than the infarcted side, and we know that it moves in the direction of more muscle mass. This kind of goes along with rule number two, which is the QRS axis always moves in the direction of hypertrophy because the more muscle mass that exists on one side, the more it draws the overall QRS vector in that direction. So the axis moves away from infarcted tissue. It moves in the direction of hypertrophy. All right, that's it for now. Stay tuned.